Hello. Hello and welcome to the Concerns of Future Generations webinar. Thank you all for attending today. This meeting is probably going to be about an hour as we have several speakers from the West Sussex Youth Cabinet, Friends of the Earth and the Green Party. My name is Katerina and I'm the Environment Lead for the West Sussex Youth Cabinet. And this is Harley Collins. I tiptoed across the tiles. Miss Fox was only a heartbeat away. The pile of keys on the sink, if, brass and copper and silver and colour seems endless. My eyes does. Thank, thank you very much. This webinar is called Concerns of Future Generations. We'll be speaking to you about what the future might look like for current younger generations and future ones. This event is hosted by Cagney, who are fighting to stop airport expansion, which are large producers of fossil fuels. Aviation has long been a battleground in the struggle between a livable future and one in which people and planet continue to be sidelined. We look to exploring the impact of decisions being made on future generations and how we ensure their voices are fully heard. We're very lucky to have some incredible speakers here today, such as Caroline Lucas, Green MP for Brighton Pavilion. Also, we have Friends of the Earth members, Rebecca Cole, who's a second year geography student at Portsmouth University. And she also works for the Young Friends of the Earth and Wildlife Conservation in the UK. And Laura McFarlane Shapes, who also works for Friends of the Earth. And there's a further education out reach manager at Friends of the Earth. To start with, I want to talk to you about the West Sussex Youth Cabinet and the concerns of future generations. West Sussex has had a youth cabinet for over 20 years and has achieved amazing things, such as passing the vote at 16 and racial inequalities webinars and debates. It's a group of democratically elected young people who represent the views of local people and also on a national level. In our current cabinet, we have over 40 young people from every corner of West Sussex and also parliament members who represent us on a national level. Through Make Your Mark, which is a survey conducted to find out what topics young people are most passionate about and want to see change in, the Youth Cabinet has focused on issues that affect its local constituents the most. Young people across the country voiced that they wanted to protect, protect the environment. This is incredibly important both locally as we're near the sea, na nationally as we're an island prone to flooding, and internationally as it could affect the delicate balance of the Earth's ecosystem. The Environment Campaign aims to make young people more conscious about their footprint on the earth. We want to positively impact the planet for the better by educating and influencing people to think about how their actions affect the planet. Young people today and future generations will ultimately live to see the consequences of climate change on our planet. In 2018, a report by climate scientists concluded that if humans don't take immediate collective action, to limit global warming by 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2040, the consequences will be effectively baked into our planet. Extreme droughts, devastating wildfires, and widespread famines that we're seeing more and more of these days will cease to be statistical anomalies. With so much heat trapping carbon in the atmosphere, there will be, in effect, no turning back. They will instead be more like seasonal markers, as regular as the changing of the leaves or April showers. It's normal to feel very scared in the face of this terrible news. It can seem insurmountable. Too little time to effectively overhaul our energy systems and stop plastic, which is in every corner of our lives. The natural forces are too big to fight against, especially for young people. I'm 14 years old, so I'll be 36 in 2040 and hopefully we'll live to see the late 21st and perhaps into the 22nd century as modern medicines advance. Generation Z and Generation Alpha are the two youngest generations currently, and future generations as well will live in this time of climate uncertainty. Who knows what the planet would look like then? It's easy to believe that this will all happen in 100 to 200 years time, but unforeseen tipping points could speed up this process and I will see the effects of it in my lifetime, as many of my friends, family, peers, generation, and our children in the future. However, humans made this problem, so surely we can fix it, sort out our carbon emissions. History has shown us that we can pull together and work towards a common goal, even when the odds are clearly insurmountable. 
for current generations and future ones, we wanted to say that we managed to mitigate the effects of climate change, that we could stop, think, help and change our behaviour. So we can look them in the eye and say we did everything we could for them to have a safe home, food, water and an education without worrying about the climate. Our concerns are for the safety of our future and for all the animals and people on this planet. We hope that with COP26 and increased climate awareness will drive this change to be better and more environmentally friendly. These are our concerns. A study done recently shows that many children have climate anxiety, which can lead to high stress, which does not help your mental health, especially as we already have many things to worry about, such as important exams. Instead of thinking about individualized solutions, community-based events, movements can help reduce our footprints, but also give a contribution on a wider level so we can feel that we're actively being more eco-conscious. So from current generations to future ones, we hope that we can mitigate the effects of climate change so our planet can return to a somewhat normal state. Sorry it took us so long, but we are going to change. Thank you. Now. I would like to pass over to Caroline Lucas, who is the fir UK's first Green MP, who we are very lucky to have speaking here today. Thank you for attending, and we're all very excited to hear what you have to say on this issue. Thank you so much, Katerina. Um, it's really kind of you uh, to give me such a nice introduction, and I'm really honoured to be with you, and congratulations as well to the Youth Cabinet. I think there is a lot of leadership coming from our young people today. Sadly, <laughs> rather less so from, uh, from our politicians. But I'm so glad that you have um, chosen to look at this issue of Gatwick expansion from the perspective of future generations. Um, and I wanted to focus maybe just on, on three things that are core to, to that theme. And, and the first is how can we better consider future generations in law and policy? Um, second, what are the risks of our current climate trajectory if we don't embark on an emergency landing pretty soon? And finally, what kind of solutions really match the scale of the problem? And I wanted to start actually by, by wondering how many of you heard David Attenborough's speech to world leaders at the start of the COP26 climate summit, because there were three things that struck me about it. He spoke a lot about future generations. He spoke a lot about stories. And he is really pretty old. And there was something I think very special about a 95 year old man talking so passionately about the future and explaining with such clarity that the decisions we take today have huge implications for decades and centuries to come. So when David Attenborough was born in 1926, I was thinking about well, what was the world like then? And 1926 saw a general strike in support of coal miners it saw someone called John Logie Baird conduct the first public demonstration of a television. It saw Gertrude Adeli become the first woman to swim the English Channel. And it saw Germany and the Soviet Union signing the Treaty of Berlin. It's not that difficult to imagine what things were like looking backwards into the past, but how easy is it to imagine forwards, to put ourselves in the shoes of our children and grandchildren? Rather than going 95 years back, what do we see if we go 95 years forward? Imagine there's a very little David Attenborough being born today. And when they reach the grand age of 95, that will be the year 2116. So what will that be like? And what would a young David find then if they Googled the year 2021, if Google is even a thing then? And the point is, I'm really pleased this event is asking about airport expansion from the perspective of future generations, because short term thinking blights our politics like never before. Mm. I was the first MP to introduce the well-being of future generations bill into the House of Commons with cross party support. And the bill is modelled on a well-being of future generations act, which was passed in Wales. They've been really trailblazing on this. And the implications of airport expansion are indeed grim for future generations, principally because of the contribution of climate change. And this act, this Future Generations Act, requires politicians now to be making policy with future generations 
in mind. And that is what we absolutely need when it comes to aviation expansion, because the government can't really proceed with aviation expansion if it's serious about its climate goals. The sums don't add up. We really are in a climate emergency. So how on earth could we be considering a plan that would mean Gatwick's total CO2 emissions in 2038 being 2.4 million tonnes, 2,000, we get the figures right here, 2.4 million tonnes per annum higher than in 2018. The fact that it's still being contemplated when it will categorically make the climate crisis worse shows how dangerously outdated it is and how short-termist our political decision-making has become. You know, if the UK had a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, I don't think we would even be having this discussion. If every government policy decision, including on airport expansion, was legally required to protect the well-being of future generations, I don't, I don't see how we could even be thinking about this, because it would require the government to do three things very differently. One, it would have to work to prevent problems such as the climate crisis, poverty and pandemics from happening, rather than dealing with the, the consequences by the time they've become emergencies. Two, it would give future generations a voice in decision making and protect them from global threats. And three, it would deliver a new sustainable vision of progress for the nation that prioritizes our environmental, social, economic and cultural well-being. And you can see how that would make a real difference in terms of the debate about Gatwick expansion, and it would make it one heck of a lot harder for that to get the green light. So today's discussion is rightly about the impacts of that expansion on our children and our planet. And I want to talk just a little bit more about that specifically from a climate perspective. And that's not to underplay the other impacts of expansion, the extra noise pollution, for example, or the extra congestion on our roads, all the potential harm to the natural environment. But from a climate perspective, I think politicians in particular need to be honest about what's at stake because there's no shortage of knowledge and expertise. The scientists have done their job. And one report that really hit home to me was done by Chatham House. And they did a climate change risk assessment um, in September. And they said, the first, the first line of that report said, the risks are compounding and without immediate action, the impacts will be devastating. So it warns that without dramatically stronger climate goals and crucially the policies and mechanisms that are needed to deliver them, many climate impacts will be locked in as early as 2040 when our young David is just 19 years old, not even at the start of their career. If emissions don't come down drastically before 2030, then by 2040, some 3.9 billion people are likely to experience major heat waves. That's 12 times more than the historic average. By the 2030s, 400 million people globally are likely to be exposed to temperatures which exceed the workability threshold. Over 10 million a year will be exposed to heat stress exceeding the survivability threshold. By 2040, 32% of global cropland could be affected by severe drought and almost 700 million people a year are likely to be exposed to droughts of at least six months duration. This is frankly a terrifying prospect. And as I say, written by experts at Chatham House who, who are extremely well experienced with a very, a very, um, yeah, a very credible background. And so frankly, it is incredibly tough to read all about that. And the scenarios assume that that countries deliver on the climate targets that they set. The report goes on to say any relapse or stasis in emission reduction policies could lead to a plausible worst case of a seven degree centigrade warming by the end of the century. It, it, it's frankly impossible to even begin to imagine what the early days of young David's retirement might look like if those were the circumstances. So mechanisms like the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act force government ministers and policymakers to think precisely about all of this and to make their decisions accordingly. And therein lies a very large part of their value. This puts the so-called economic benefits of an airport expansion into perspective, if indeed there were any to begin with. 
And it brings me to my last substantive point, the need for solutions that measure up to the scale of the problems, not business as usual with a few green trimmings, not incremental fuel efficiency improvements, and certainly not unicorn technological fixes that are always just over there, always just at the end of the rainbow. One of those big, bold, sensible solutions is a Green New Deal for Gatwick. You know, the pandemic led to many thousands of redundancies in UK airports last year, despite seven billion pounds of public support and the coronavirus job retention scheme. In this context, the Green New Deal for Gatwick, it's a report that's been written by PCS, by Greenhouse and by Green New Deal UK, chart a much better, much more secure way forward for Gatwick and for Gatwick's workers. It found that 16,000 green jobs could be created through investment in the Gatwick Diamond region. It recognizes that the transition to a prosperous zero carbon economy requires huge amounts of work, insulating home, green energy, restoring nature, public transport, and so on. And crucially, it recognized the wealth of skills that aviation workers have and the overwhelming case for public investment to provide the opportunities and the financial security needed to enable them to move into these new kinds of roles if they wish to. Mm. And the estimated cost of creating 16,000 green jobs is comparable to Gatwick's share of the 12 month air passenger duty suspension that Airlines UK have been lobbying for. Mm. Yet for that same money, a Green New Deal for Gatwick would, would create twice the number of jobs in this area mm. as cutting air passenger duty would do. This is the sort of solution that we need to push for. Governments can and must invest urgently in secure green jobs and a just transition. They must support aviation workers in line with their ambition for a green recovery. And the same goes for other high carbon sectors. So to wrap up then, what can we do? Well, a lot. We're in a climate emergency and everything matters, whether that's taking the train rather than the plane, sending another email to your MP, filling in your first ever consultation response, joining a protest like those all over the world last Saturday, telling stories or something else. But most immediately, I would invite you to do three things. First, visit the Cagney website and use the content to help submit your views to the consultation on Gatwick expansion before the closing date of the 1st of December. Second, ask your MP to support a new parliamentary motion. It's early day motion number 544, and it calls for a Green New Deal bill. Perhaps even sign up to the National Green New Deal campaign or explore collaboration with local Green New Deal campaigners if there are some in your area. And third, help bring the Wellbeing of Future Generations bill into law by signing up. And the website for that is called todayfortomorrow.org.uk. And that's the campaign site run for the bill by um, The Big Issue, because Lord Bird, the founder of The Big Issue, has been really critical on the whole issue of future generations, and he's been pressing a bill in the House of Lords. So thank you for the chance to join you here this evening. I'm actually in Glasgow. Um, oh. but I'm very glad to, to, to pop in and, uh, and, and, and to have this conversation. Um, and I urge you all to feel, to feel powerful and empowered, because in a sense, we have more agency now than ever to, de to determine our future, to determine little David's future and indeed the future of our planet. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, sorry, we are not able to take questions at the moment. There'll be a Q&A session at the end, but we do have a couple of pre-written questions for Caroline, if you're all right to answer those. Um, so the first one, what challenges did you face being the only Green MP in Parliament? <laughs> um, well, it is a bit lonely, um, but I have to say what it does teach you is the importance of making alliances with, with others in other parties and finding areas of common ground. And, you know, I think that's a positive thing to try to do. All too often in politics, we focus on our difference from each other, and that can be important sometimes. But if we want to get things done, basically, we need to work together. And so I'm very pleased, for example, that that Green New Deal bill that I just talked about is something that I'm working with the Labour MP Clive Lewis on. Um, and indeed, there are members of, of, of the Liberal Democrats from Plaid Cymru, from the SNP, um, all of them um, are, are helping to support that bill. So. So I think although 
you know, there's some practical difficulties in terms of getting access to information sometimes when you're an MP on your own. I think it teaches you to work with, closely with others and that can only be a good thing. Yes, I agree. Um, what are the biggest ways we can make a difference in our everyday lives? Well, I mean, there are so many ways that we can make a difference in our everyday lives. And, and usually when people answer that question, they think in terms of our roles as consumers. And that is important, but the point I wanted to stress really was about our role as citizens, because I think that's much more important. And that in a sense is what this meeting is about. And it's about what your youth cabinet is about. And it's about you know, every time we consider, you know, who we're going to vote for or, you know, what kind of organizations we're going to get involved in. So although there are things we can do if you like, as consumers. So we can eat less meat. We can, um, we can switch our energy sources to green energy. Um, if, if it's possible to, we can use more public transport. We can um, you know, do those things in our, in our everyday lives. But I think I would like to focus more on the importance of lobbying MPs, of filling in that consultation that, 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 that Cagney is, is promoting you know, really making clear that we can get involved as, as a community and raise our voices and, and make a difference that way to the whole kind of political debate. Because although behavior change is important, you know, I think it's true to say that systems change is even more important. And for as long as we've got an economy that is based on, you know, thinking that progress should be measured simply in GDP growth, the growth of gross domestic product, rather than thinking that, our economy should deliver in terms of our social and environmental um, desires and, and in terms of well-being of ourselves and of our planet, you know, for as long as we have an economic system that's designed to deliver the wrong outcomes, then however much we turn down the thermostat or put less water in the kettle, it's not going to add up to a solution that is big enough for the problems that we face. Thank you. One final one. What actions are going to be taken after COP26 by the government and what do you think is most important to focus on? Well, I mean, that's a really good question. And of course, COP26 runs for at least one more day. I'm hearing people up here in Glasgow saying that they think, they think it may well run into Saturday as well. Um, and we know that if you add up all of the emission reduction targets that people have made or countries have made so far, then rather than keeping below 1.5 degrees, we'll be on course for 2.4 degrees of, of heating, which is really worrying. So we need to keep the pressure up about that. We need to keep the pressure up in particular around the finance that is due to the developing countries in which the richer countries simply haven't delivered until now. But in terms of a campaign, whatever happens here in, in Glasgow, I think a big campaign has got to be going forward about keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Um, because the trouble is there's, often quite a lot of focus about, you know, an investment in the green economy and in, and in renewable energies, and, and that's really important. But for as long as that's running alongside the continuation of giving money to fossil fuels and subsidies to fossil fuels and going ahead with the Cambo oil field, for example, or indeed aviation expansion, then any amount of good green stuff doesn't outweigh the bad gray or brown stuff, if you like. And that's why it's so important to keep fossil fuels in the ground. And so I just wanted to flag two very quick things that you might have time to look at later. One is the launch of um, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's a campaign by, it's an international campaign actually, um, by lots of different organizations. And there's a big call for MPs from all different countries to sign it as well. And just like the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was all about providing an architecture that would enable countries to move towards trying to get rid of nuclear weapons. So the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is again an architecture to try to engage countries to leave fossil fuels in the ground. And on that same note, today in Glasgow, there was a new initiative launched by Denmark and Costa Rica called Beyond Oil and Gas, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. And those to me feel like very specific campaigns to get involved in that we can really measure success against. Um, and, and so certainly that's one of the things that I think is going to be important to pursue no matter what happens in Glasgow. Right now, there's a big fight going on about the draft text. In the draft text, it talks about 
phasing out fossil fuel subsidies and Saudi Arabia and Russia and India are objecting to that text, even though there's no date. <laughs> so it's not saying phase out fossil fuel subsidies by 2025 or 2030 or even 2050, it just says phase them out. And even though there's no date, there's already this massive pushback from, from those three countries. So that's going to be a real battleground, I think, going forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you for speaking for us today. It's been great to hear what you had to say. Thank you so much. And now we're going to move on to Rebecca and Laura from the Friends of the Earth group, if you would like to take it away. Yeah, hi there. Um, lovely to be on the same panel as you, Caroline Lucas. Um, so I'm Rebecca, I'm from Hampshire and I'm studying geography at the University of Portsmouth. So I'll hopefully become a researcher in paleoecology and conservation. And I've been asked to talk to you today about alternative green jobs to the work in Air Gatwick Airport. So from personal experience, it's been extremely hard to find green jobs, especially as a young disabled person. And in the past, I've needed to work in retail, such as at things, which I wouldn't consider you know, as they invest in fossil fuels and are extremely bad when it comes to plastic waste because everyone, everything's just covered in plastic. Um, now it's called, of course it's not my fault that I need to work in needed to work in an unsustainable job because investments where the government are specifically aimed into fossil fuel companies and this investment happens because of politicians being lobbied to invest in these sectors. I found green volunteering available for me and an amazing group of people to campaign alongside. However, I don't think there is enough investment into green jobs which is necessary for a just green transition. Um, so there are different types of green jobs, some that are officially green under the definition and help society work towards a greener future, such as jobs in renewable energy and conservation. And there are other green jobs which aren't necessarily classified under green jobs, as the way they are green is based on the fact they don't emit greenhouse gases or create environmental pollution or devastation in their work, for example, nursing and caring. Um, the focus on these officially classified green jobs sometimes can lead to the exclusion of fields typically dominated by women and non-binary people or people of colour, with a main focus on ma white male dominated fields. There are also class jobs which, according to my professor at uni, that are classified under muddy brown or brown, and these are jobs that create the pollution and environmental issues such as those in aviation or fossil fuel extraction sites, which is something we need to transition out of. So over time, looking at the official national statistics from 2018, there's been an increase in green jobs, and these include environmental consultancy, engineering, insulation activities, and waste and recycling management. And these particularly push the country to be more green in its businesses and systems. And these jobs will hopefully be on the rise just as we emerge from the high unemployment levels caused by the pandemic. And the fact that it's becoming clearer that the climate crisis is human induced will push this growth even further. So uh, Gatwick Airport has argued ever since environment, uh, environmental activists have challenged them that the airport is a profound part of the community in particular boosting the economy. However, as we see so clearly now, a transition away from fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel jobs is necessary to combat the climate emergency. And so the jobs in the airport need to be transitioned away from emitters, such as the airport, towards greener parts of the economy. It's often argued that green air travel is becoming more of reality and that there's no need to transition away from air travel. However, there are serious issues of sustainability around these new technologies. I have two examples of what are considered sustainable aviation technologies. So sustainable aviation fuel or SAF, for example, is in no way sustainable as it requires mass amounts of waste cooking oil or biofuel, which neither are in mass production. Cooking oil can only go so far in supplying fuel and to supply airplanes with biofuel for the current number of flights occurring, and we would need an area the size of the la of land the size of India covered in plant mass to sustain a plant to sustain flights, which would include needing to deforest areas. 
Number two is electronic air travel, which is developing, but is not yet developed far enough to support our current flights. Uh, I think there was a 50 kilometer flight from, I don't know if it was kilometers, a flight from Australia to New Zealand or something like that, but it's nowhere near developed enough for us to use it, like to support our current flights. And so a transition away from air flights is necessary. And so we need to transition people in jobs in Gatwick and other airports to green jobs. And this is necessary now. Looking around Gatwick in areas such as Crawley at your everyday job searching website, <laughs> there are a few green jobs available on three websites, including like Indeed. I found only 123 jobs, which I would consider green, which could not sustain the Crawley population of 144,000 people. All the 7,745 people were employed at Gatwick Airport. There is significant opportunity for green jobs in Crawley and around Gatwick and other areas, which you can see by looking at the NOMIS labour market profile, specifically in jobs such as public transport, waste management, and scientific study. However, we need more investment into these sectors by the government to strengthen the transition away from the airport's jobs and away from air travel altogether as the future for it is not sustainable. Looking at Gatwick Airport's website, we can see it's full of greenwashing of the impacts the airport has on the environment, uh, especially when it talks about the factor of becoming net zero, which is next to impossible for an airport without different negative environmental or unethical practices carried out, such as deforestation for biofuel to grow and mining for lithium batteries, which, ten which tends to be done by child laborers in the global south. Lost. And this is whilst also stating it intends to expand the airport. Expanding the airport and next area don't exactly go hand in hand. Gatwick Airport expansion should not be happening during a climate crisis, and we need to cut emissions now. And this means less flights, not more. And so we need to transition the people who work in the airport now to create economic sustainability for all these people, depending as such on the airport. Um, I believe green jobs are the future and Young Friends of the Earth and I intend to promote them through community organizing as we are incredibly concerned for the future of our climate. And so a just green transition is necessary for the climate crisis to be combated. Um, I'll hand over, thank you for letting me speak. I'll hand over to Laura now. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, that was so good to hear. Um, so my name is Laura and I manage the further education outreach programs at Friends of the Earth, so working in our gorgeous colleges um, in England and Wales and soon to be Northern Ireland. Um, and I was asked to come here because I sit within the youth and families team supporting the current generation of young people and, and children with families. Um, and until we can hear from little David as he's soon to be born um, and learns to speak soon. Um, so at Friends of the Earth, all our uh, youth programmes work with young people on the front lines of the climate crisis, primarily working class, racialised uh, and disabled young people who often breathe the dirtiest air. I'm here in East London, um, where there's some of the dirtiest air in the country, just a few miles away from the dirtiest air in the country where they're proposing to build even more infrastructure to make the air even dirtier with Silvertown Tunnel that is right next to one of the colleges, the popular campus of Tower Hamlets College, which is where um, is one of the places that we work um, in our youth programme. Um, and lots of young people as well who have um, heritage from countries who are most affected by climate change as well. So in some of the places in the UK, most affected by environmental injustices and around the world. Um, and I wanted to share three stories from them uh, today because um, they are incredible and can't be here today. <laughs> and so I will do my best uh, to represent them and I'll share some um, videos afterwards, but uh, I, the audio quality isn't amazing. So apologies for that, but it was on the fly in meetings and things. Um, so first I want to share uh, about a wonderful young woman called Umi, um, who I met four years ago in her, her, her college. Um, and they started a very, um, what you would think of as a very straightforward campaign of just having recycling bins in their classrooms. Like, 
this is ridiculous. Uh, all the climate catastrophe, the simplest thing that we could start with, they're just recycling a bottle in our classroom. No. And it took them a full eight months to get that into place. Um, but they learned so much and learning to be dogged, to navigating the bureaucracy of these huge colleges and all the subcontractors um, and set them up to be incredible campaigners. And there's now some recycling bins, <laughs> which is a good bear, bear essential. Um, but what Amy's gone on to do is so much more than a few recycling bins and a few classrooms. Um, and what I wanted to share with you uh, today is when she spoke at um, in in Parliament. I'm not sure if you were there, Caroline, but um, no job for if you weren't. I'm sure very busy. Uh, to 60 ministers, MPs, and business leaders at the time is now protest um, day of action. And so she shared. Um, that her, she, her family's from Bangladesh and that by 2050, one, it's, if we projected to carry on as we are at the moment, one in seven people will be displaced by climate change. It's 18 million people in her home country. And she shared that a few years ago, she'd been back to Bangladesh to visit her family. And it was during the monsoon season and the rains were so bad that she couldn't leave the village that it got up to her knees. And she says, this is just casual for Bangladesh. This is just normal every day as it's getting more and more, um, as climate change is affecting the monsoon seasons more and more. And so that if that happened in London, <laughs> if that happened in most parts of the UK, we'd be rushing disaster relief out. Boris would be there in his hard hat and wellies um, and there would be massive media attention onto it. But that's just the everyday. And that makes her terrified about what the future holds of what, if that's what the rain is like now in 2019 maybe that was um what's it going to be like in the future so she ended her her speech in parliament talking to politicians as caroline said so frustrated with their short-term um attitudes that they were they were saying so it's, it's always economic over environment and i'm sick of it we just don't have the choice anymore that's how she sent them home <laughs> um I want to share also with this wonderful student called Navida, whose family is from India. Um, and they uh, were... Mm. Oh, yeah. They held an assembly um, oh. across. Oh. You froze for a moment, Laura. Yes, you froze for a little while, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, <laughs> carry on, Do carry on. Um, so Navida was addressing her college um, senior management um, to call on them to sign this charter that's been made by students um, and they asked her why, why do you care so much about climate change and so she shared um, similarly to Ami that she goes um, back to her home country every every few years and has done her, or her whole life and her um where her family comes from there's a huge lake that is really really important locally to um uh for getting food for fish from the lake and also the local economy as well of selling fish so yeah it's kind of a fishing economy locally and every time she was going back she could see the lake getting smaller and smaller and smaller um, until while well, she was a teenager at college she went back and it got so small that very few people could live off the lake anymore um, and one of their family friends sadly died by suicide um, because he couldn't support himself he couldn't support his family anymore um, and that, that was, oh, sorry, it's making me emotional thinking about her telling the story. Um, and that's not the core, you know, no one there was causing climate change. <laughs> They're just living the way that they have done for millennia in a completely beautifully sustainable way of sustainable fishing and sustainable kind of land management. Um, and yet this was a kind of being done to them uh, after the legacy of colonialism in this new wave as well. 
so her fury you could feel that through the room <laughs> I can feel it now years later um, and the college signed up very readily <laughs> as you can imagine to this green charter um, and have been one of the most active colleges ever since um, in taking in taking environmental action and then finally I wanted to share the story of um, Youssef um, who came from Ghana four years ago now, three years ago when he was um, making the speech. And I don't know whether any of you guys remember when marvellous Greta Thunberg um, came to the UK a couple of years ago, just before COVID, and came to speak in Parliament um, at an all parliamentary uh, group, um, or parliamentary party group, sorry, get my acronyms right, APPG, with Michael Gove, then the Environment Minister. So Yusuf and a few other students were invited along to hear from her and to contribute to, to that debate. And he shared that um, in his home country in, in Ghana, farming is the main source of income for, for most people. Um, and over the years, and his, his family is um, farmers as well, water, watermelon farmers. Um, and he said, over the years, you realize that crops are no longer growing and people are, are no longer able to harvest what they could and are no longer able to sponsor their children to go to school and access the health healthcare that they need. Um, and so I want to end with what his challenge. Uh, so even though MPs, know about the impact of climate change they still went ahead and voted for the ex expansion of Heathrow Airport what would you say to those MPs and I've only seen the video I wasn't uh, <laughs> we'd let the young people be there but the next three questions after that then were about airport expansion and so I wanted particularly to share that one because we can see when it when those two pieces are connected when the impact of climate change around the world and the hypocrisy of supporting air, airport expansion in the UK are put together, then it does roll, it does roll and people can make those connections. Um, so I'm so glad that I got to come and speak to you all tonight and completely applaud the Youth Parliament and Cagney and everyone um, who is yeah doing what they can to stop, uh, stop this disaster. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Becca and Laura for your amazing speeches and also for all the great comments in the comments section we'll have a question and answer session at the end but now I'd like to invite Harley Collins to speak he's also a member of the youth cabinet he's going to tell us a bit more about what we've been up to and our environment campaign. Wonderful thanks Katarina so hi everyone my name is Harley Collins I'm a member of youth parliament for Chichester and West Arran and I'm representing the Youth Cabinet tonight, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about us for you. Um, so the West Sussex Youth Cabinet is a group of democratically elected young people by young people, representing the viewpoints of young people, both locally and nationally. As part of our work in the West Sussex Youth Cabinet, we run campaigns off of the national Make Your Mark ballot results, with Make Your Mark being the largest youth consultation in the country. As an aside from this, I'd just like to mention that West Sussex achieved the most number of votes in the most recent consultation in 2020, beating entire regions like London, and in previous years, beating everyone else in our region of the southeast. There we go. There's my little boast out of the way. <laughs> um, following the results of Make Your Mark, where young people aged 11 to 18 vote on topics in which are most prevalent to them, youth voice groups around the country carry out campaigns to voice perspective of young people on these issues. For multiple years now, protecting the environment has been a major issue on the Youth Voice agenda, as well as the main political agenda. Therefore, in West Sussex, we have made strides to ensure we highlight the need to protect the environment and further develop constructive action towards it. We have worked with Faroe World Linfield, the Marine Conservation Society, West Sussex County Council, with the importance of pollination and the effects on it, of it on nature, and of course, the, sponsor this, the sponsors of this event, Cagney. These are examples where our representatives have had the opportunity to be at the forefront of conversations which will affect young people in our communities for years to come, including little David. We have also arranged work of our own. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, 
we had arranged a county-wide beach clean event to take place, with large numbers of people signed up to participate, including MPs and county councillors. Our event idea spread to East Sussex too, who were planning to arrange to continue our efforts in their county, and we will make sure that this goes on in the near future. Now, I can't talk about the West Sussex Youth Cabinet and the work in which we do without briefly mentioning some of our other campaigns, as you may be interested. So we've run a successful knife crime awareness campaign that placed second in the National Crime Beat Awards. In this campaign, we created poignant posters in conjunction with Sussex Police, which emphasised the need to stop carrying knives, with slogans such as, if it's a knife you choose, you're destined to lose, being used on them. Katerina also briefly mentioned earlier about the Votes 16 campaign in which we ran, where we agreed and lobbied the West Sussex County Councillors at the time to agree to passing the motion of Vote 16 and taking that to National Parliament if it were to come up in, in a uh, bill. We also have an ongoing campaign which aims to tackle racial inequality. We're having ongoing discussions with West Sussex County Council on how we can improve the way in which young people are being educated about different religions and ethnicities, as well as as recently as yesterday, having discussions with multiple school executives in which we are pushing a new scheme from our campaign, in which we aim to have ambassadors in schools who push the need for young people to be aware of injustices and issues in society. For without fully understanding what the problem is, one can never fully find the, the best solution for it. When it comes to protecting the environment though, we need to ensure society is as educated as possible to the effects in which our actions cause to the planet, and thus taught the way in which we can reduce the way in which we negatively affect our planet to ensure that future generations can enjoy it to the extent that previous ones have done so. Uh, there we go. I would also like to mention, whilst we're talking about the Youth Cabinet, about how we have lots of opportunities available to people that are involved in Youth Voice to have further understanding of the environment and protecting the environment and what you can do to uh, limit the effects of climate change. So one such uh, experience that was offered to our, to our members was to go to a solar farm prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I know it may seem minor, but having that brief understanding to take, take some young people to a to the solar farm in person and explain the effects of how it works, what, where, what it does and where what is generated goes, was very in insightful for the young people that were there. And it really took away the mindset of understanding the forward thinking modern ways of technology and how this can help us in the future. And uh, it was it was highly, highly anticipated to happen again in the, in the following year, but unfortunately the pandemic hit us right as that was planned, I believe. <laughs> and in the spirit of opportunities, I'd just like to briefly mention in my final closing that the West Sussex Youth Cabinet elections are coming up soon in the new year. So if you or anyone you know would be interested in, in applying to become a Youth Cabinet or Youth Parliament a member and lives or works in West Sussex, please make sure to follow us on all of our social media sites and keep informed as up, as up to what we're doing. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Harley for your amazing speech and to all our speakers as well. Now we're going to have a question and answer session. Um, so if you have any questions, I know there are a few already on the chat, they can be answered now. So uh, Armel Thomas, do you have your hand raised? Do you have a question? Yes, sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself. <laughs> oh, we can hear you perfectly. Can you? Thank you very much indeed. Well, Katarina, I, I wanted to praise you for the way you spoke. I think it was wonderful to hear someone of 14 being so fluent and, and, and knowing your subject so well. I just wanted to mention that Cagney is not fighting airport expansion. They are fighting Gatwick airport expansion. Um, I have been living near Heathrow Airport for 52 years and fought for 28 years. And I've always felt that if Gatwick and uh, Heathrow residents had actually fought together, we might be a bit further down the line, but that is in the past. Um, um, I, I think that we can still allow people to fly, but to have better airports, uh, which mean lesser flight, 
I think that uh, what happened with uh, um, COVID-19 is that it showed that all the councils uh, around the country who put all their eggs in the industry basket of ISRO or uh, airports or airline were the one who actually paid the penalty um, during the, um, the, the COVID um, uh, pandemic. And if we are some of the worst people with a lot of unemployment, it is thanks to all the, the uh, council who actually, instead of finding green jobs, uh, were only happy to actually for people to work at Israel Airport on a minimum wage, possibly even less. Um, I am actually sort of speaking with passion. Um, I'm 75 and I'm glad that there is a youth cabinet and there are young people um, taking the, uh, the baton. Um, as I said, I've been fighting for 28 years. Uh, and uh, in 2015, when John Hollenke, the chief executive of ISRO, sent a letter uh, to, um, or actually it wasn't even sent, it was presented by hand to us uh, on the 1st of July, 2015. My husband died eight weeks later in my arms of a broken heart. He was 93, he was a war hero. He'd given up his nationality to actually fight for, the, um, for, for, for king and country. Uh, and that was his, you know, the end. Uh, I'm still fighting. For, uh, against history expansion. Um, and for us, there won't be any insulation for the history villages. That's 15,000 people who will be bulldozed or put in such a position that they will not be able to actually leave. So um, what I would like to say is we have a youth cabinet in Hillingdon. I think it would be a good idea if all the youth cabinet actually got together I was terribly impressed by um, the people who spoke at the COP26, and I've obviously followed it very closely um, because of where I'm, I'm, I'm living. Um, I have been fighting, as I said, you know, to save the future generation. I Amanda, think it is now Amanda. your generation. Sorry, can I interrupt you a moment? We, did, um... We really appreciate you, you um, um, participating and joining us this evening. Um, I just wanted to say to you that Cagney works with all the groups. We've worked with HACCAM for many, many years, and Cagney doesn't actually support any airport expansion. We work with um, airport groups all over the world. We have a network, and we all work together to oppose all airport expansion, just that we focus on Gatwick, it's purely just because we're based around Gatwick. But we work with HACCAM, HACCAM East, Bristol, Southampton, um, and the friends of the earth um, have a network as well, so we all do. Um, I'm just aware of, of time and I didn't want to interrupt you, but did you have a question for, for the cabinet or for friends of the earth or for Caroline Lucas? Otherwise we, we need to take a question from another person. I, I do apologize for interrupting you. No, oh, that, that's fine, I understand. But I would like all the youth cabinet to get together uh, around all the airports in the UK and fight uh, against airport expansion because it is their future, it is their planet. My future is behind me. It is for them to actually take the baton and, and do it. So if all the youth cabinet got together the way that the young people got together at COP26, I think we might get a better planet for Absolutely. all of you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you've got a very good point there. I'm sure Katerina and, and Harley will, will, will take that up and I really appreciate that. So um, Katerina, do you want to take another, another question? Yes, thank you, Armel. That was really interesting to hear. And Phil maybe asked Caroline, how significant is the UK's new oil and coal extraction plants, etc., in India, not signing up to the non-dated non agreement on fossil fuel funding? Uh, thanks, Katrina, and thanks, Philip. I mean, I don't think one could draw a direct line and say because the UK is continuing with oil and coal extraction, that's why India doesn't want to sign up to the fossil fuel funding issue. I don't think it's quite as direct as that. But what I do think is that the UK has lost any kind of moral authority to suggest to India that it, uh, that it changes its position while we ourselves are going ahead with the Cambo oil field and quite likely with the Cumbrian coal field. So I think that's indirectly linked. And it does mean that, as I say, our moral authority to lecture other countries to do the right thing 
is severely undermined if we're not doing the right thing ourselves, particularly as, as the president of the COP. Mm. Thank you very much, Caroline. If anyone else has any other questions, please raise your hand or put them on the chat. Okay, uh, Sally? <laughs> May I ask Caroline a question? Um, we were shocked that um, the Treasury halved um, the domestic um, APD, air passenger duty prior to, to COP26. Um, and also, I mean, long haul, the, the, the increase on in long haul, I mean, you can still fly to America and not be impacted by it. Um, how has this really gone down in Parliament? I mean, was it, was it purely aviation lobbying or, or was there a real cross party that this is something good for the economy? Um, I mean, can you provide an insight into that? I can tell you that we were all incredibly shocked. I, th I think actually, to be fair, people on both sides of the of the house were pretty shocked. Um, I don't even know if Rishi Sunak quite realised what an environmental own goal he was he was scoring. Um, I mean, he obviously thought this was a way of of um, you know buying a bit of popularity. So he thought, um, and and it's obviously I think it has backfired because there, there's been so much anger, certainly from the opposition opposition benches, but also I think some on the conservative benches are thinking, why would you just on the eve of COP? Mm -hmm. do something that is so obviously anti-environmental and, and, and so obviously, you know, driving the climate crisis. I mean, that whole budget statement, I have to say, was quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he didn't mention uh, climate change and, uh, you, you know, the, the, only, the only big policy that people remember is this really bad APD uh, <laughs> decision. So, yeah, it, it, it is utterly um, extraordinary. What we do know is that the Treasury does tend to block um, greater movement on this agenda. I mean, I'm not suggesting that, that Boris, Boris Johnson is necessarily, um, you, you know, uh, somebody who, who personally feels that he wants to move this agenda, but I think he recognizes that there would be some support for him if he did. And you do get the sense there's a big fight going on between the Treasury and number 10. Um, mm. and, and for the budget, uh, certainly the, the Treasury won. Can I just say, Katerina, while I have the floor, I'm so sorry, I will have to leave dead on eight o'clock for another meeting. Oh, yes, no the... worries. Thank you for attending so much. I know your life's probably really busy right now. With COP26. Thanks so much. And thanks for all your, your work, Katerina. It's really impressive. I think, I think we have time for one or two more questions. So Anne Stuart asked, um, what is the level of unemployment around Gatwick now? Is employment recovering to pre-COVID levels? And am I right in thinking that employment was very low before COVID? Would Becca or Laura like to answer this one? Um, I can have a go. <laughs> I'm not an expert around Gatwick because I don't um, actually live there, all the areas around Gatwick, but I do know that unemployment levels did, signif did quite significantly rise. To, um, they rose 5.1% during the um, pandemic and this included 1,400 jobs which were cut at Gatwick Airport which shows the instability of the airport to provide good and stable jobs rather than the other areas which could provide green jobs. Um, I think most areas are recovering quite well but I'm not quite sure about pre-COVID levels however um, it, information like that is readily available on the on NOMIST, N-O-M-I-S, and the, oh, I can't remember what the name was, um, it's the NOMA, NOMIST Labour Profile in Crawley, which is the nearest town, but it is readily available there, and I'm sure for other areas around um, Gatwick, I hope that answers your question, a little bit at least. Thank you very much, Becca. Uh, I'm just trying to get the chat back up. Oh yeah, and one fine, oh, Caroline has unfortunately left us, but if anyone else would like to answer this question, what do you think is the best way to debunk the jet zero concept? If anyone has any opinions on that subject, no worries, if not. <laughs> would, you like me to, would you like me to help? <laughs> yeah, you can go ahead. 
the the only thing I'd say on the on the Jet Zero front is that it's a good initiative, but unfortunately, it's uh, giving hope to airports such as Gatwick Airport that they can lobby hard enough for ministers to believe that they shouldn't burst the bubble, that aviation will come good, it will find an alternative magical fuel, it will find the technology that makes them um, jet zero. Unfortunately, reality is that it's it's still on the drawing board. It's 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 not in manufactured currently. And SAF, as as you've rightly pointed out, it has a carbon footprint, but it also is very limited in supply. So we have to hope that something good will come from Jet Zero. But the the thinking is that it is going to be more of your carbon trading or offsetting, which actually doesn't reduce the greenhouse gases or the carbon that's being released into the atmosphere. It's just trying to make the consumer feel it's still OK to fly when in actual fact reality is it's not OK to fly. And that's why the Committee on Climate Change has called for constraint on aviation. Um, carbon trading is, is, is going to be even more and more expensive because industry like aviation is going to have to buy carbon from other industries such as like Tesla. So, so it's, it's, it's not looking good. It's a good initiative, but it's not looking good. And, and unfortunately, a lot, uh, so far a lot of spin has come out of it. Lots of talk, not a lot of action, because there's not one sil a single silver bullet for aviation to carry on flying. Thank you very much. Did, did you want to say anything on that, Becca? Or... Um, obviously, the best way of debunking it is through education. Um, it is just mostly a load of greenwashing that they try to push forward so that people still use their business, even though it's unsustainable for our futures. Um, but um, I put in the chat, um, my other campaign, which is called Fossil Free London, has good information source on Instagram at Fossil Free London, and it tells all about that they're and debunking it. And it's as I said, education is the most important factor in Cagney and other groups are the best, probably one of the best sources rather than governmental sources. <laughs> okay, that's Thank great. You. We've 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 um we're just going over eight o'clock, so um. Perhaps, Katerina, if you want to. Yes, thank you everyone for attending thank, and thank you for all your questions. I hope you've really enjoyed it and learned something new from all our amazing speakers and can go away and make change like Caroline said in your local communities to just help out a bit and mitigate the effects of climate change. So thank you all again for attending. And can I just close, um, as, as, as Cagney posted, I just really like to thank everybody for joining us this evening. I'm sorry I've got a little bit over. I'd like to really thank two wonderful speakers from Friends of the Earth for joining us this evening, for Katerina, for, for Harley, for the West Sussex uh, Youth Cabinet. It's been wonderful to have this forum this evening, um, to have a, an exchange of, of young minds and, and the thoughts going forward. Now, um, the next talk we have is on 25th of November, Thursday, 25th of November. It's alternative to fly for pleasure. We have two keynote speakers for that. Um, if you'd like to book, please do book. You can do it via our website, which is www.cagney.org. The deadline for the Gatwick expansion, the second runway, the rebuilding of the emergency runway as a second runway is the 1st of December. You can just simply write, say no, whether that's by email, or by their free post address, or you can actually participate in the consultation, but you do not have to do all 13 questions. You can just say you strongly oppose for climate reasons or, or, or whatever you would like to do. But please do participate, ensure you have a voice. Don't leave it down to other people to do that because unfortunately Gatwick is reliant upon skies being quiet currently for people to be asleep to what is going on, but this will have serious ramifications for our planet. A second runway, conservatively, will be over 1 million tonnes of extra carbon every year, plus greenhouse gases, plus a 40% growth of the main runway. So please do um, 
participate in that consultation. And I look, look forward to seeing you all at another meeting on the 25th of November. And I thank you ever so much for all joining us this evening. And I think I'm going to say well done. Um, huge, great to have Caroline Lucas with us for so long this evening. That was just amazing. And um, well done everybody for attending. Thank you. And thank, thank you to Cagney for hosting as well. Pleasure, pleasure, delighted to. Everyone have a good evening and thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye bye.